Okay, uh, with the with the recording uh, restarted, I guess uh, we can uh, start the uh, um, second lecture by Anusha whenever uh, she is ready. Uh, yes, sorry, I just uh, one second. Let me. Just yeah, yeah, take your time. Take your time. No hurry. Okay. Um. Okay, so should I just get going? Kun, is that? Uh, well, uh, there has been several new postings on the in the chats. I don't know whether I mean there, there were already a couple of questions before we ended the first lecture. Yes, I saw that. And um... yeah, yeah, and there are new ones that popped up. Um, and uh, uh, I guess uh, you can maybe select a subset of them that you think are most appropriate to address, and then move on. Um, to okay, so um, uh, maybe I will uh, maybe address just one or two of them. So someone had asked, Anupam had asked, uh, does the random distribution in the ETH have to be Gaussian or does any other uh, distribution work in that way, in the same way? So, um, uh, so that's uh, another interesting question. So I think the... Um, the ETH does um, say that it should be Gaussian. Uh, and the way I understand that is, um, I don't know if I could show it real time, but I think it kind of follows from a um, central limiting type of argument that, that you, you need a distribution that is stable to, that's the same distribution. When you add a bunch of them, you have to get the same distribution out as what each of them are. Uh, and, and the Gaussian is one that has that property. Um, so short answer here is I actually think the ETH uh, and, and the random vector way of thinking about it does force it to be Gaussian. Um, even though for the purposes of, of uh, what I said, it, it seems like other ones could work, um, but, but, but I'm, not, I'm not showing it to you right here. Um, so okay, that's short answer. Um, uh, someone asked about which entropy did I have in mind. Uh, it's the so the it's it's the standard entropy as in uh, classical mechanics, which is the von Neumann entropy, which will coincide with what people make would call an entanglement entropy as well. Um, and that's what the second law is written for. Uh, uh, someone asked, why is the factor of one over square root density states the correct scale of the fluctuation of the ETH ansatz? Um, another good question. To see that, uh, I think you can you can convince yourself that that has to be this case if the um, uh, norm of the operator O, so basically if trace O dagger O has to be, is, is a uh, finite number or whatever the norm is, even if it's, if it's scaling with L, in order that that um, uh, be, poly and L alone, you need that these, uh, because there are exponentially many states in the uh, energy uh, spectrum, you need that the amplitudes go down as one over square root. Basically, it's for normalization. Maybe another way to say it is that if you looked at this bit here, um, uh, in, in if the, uh, you need the, um, the, the weights of the random matrix to go down as one over square root number of states, so that the new eigenvectors that you get out are, are normalized. So that fixes the scale. Um, yeah, I think maybe that was quick uh, answers to all everything I see. Um, yes. All right. So um, then maybe with that, I will I will move on to the second lecture on many body localization. Many body localization. Um, or MBL. Uh, and I've written this lecture in view of uh, a little bit of uh, history, not all the relevant history, uh, but also trying in light of um, kind of where uh, the current uh, controversy slash uh, researches in, in the field. So, um, yeah. 
All right, so uh, let me start with, instead of many body localization, let me first start with uh, what is known as Anderson localization or single particle localization, uh, which is a phenomenon um, first described by Anderson now a long time ago, uh, which, is, which is really uh, a counterexample to what we were talking about in lecture one about thermalization. Uh, which is that generic, uh, strongly spatially inhomogeneous space. I'll write out all these words because uh, it, it's useful to have them on the screen as we get going on what kinds of systems will do will be localized. Um, so generic, strongly spatially inhomogeneous, and uh, for the for the purposes of Anderson, what, what's now come to be known as Anderson localization, these are non-interacting systems. Um, do not thermalize in isolation. Okay. Um, and, and this is, so uh, what are the crucial words here? Uh, uh, generic, which is really that we're, we're, we're not, it's not a fine tuned phenomenon. This is, this is what uh, happens as long as the ingredient that we need is strong uh, spatial and homogeneity. Um, and Anderson was motivated by uh, actual experiments in a, in a real um, uh, system with, with in thinking about spin transport in it. Uh, but what he ended up solving and what has now become a field of its own is, uh, is non-interacting. So we'll start there too. Okay, and I know this do not thermalize is something that we understand. It's that the uh, this equivalence of late time um, uh, density matrix in part A uh, for for all, all initial states does not equal what is uh, the corresponding um, microcanonical or canonical prediction. Okay, so uh, first things first is you should be like, uh, you know, why maybe. Is this even surprising? Why did this thing get a Nobel Prize? It was a, it's a part of a citation of uh, the citation for Anderson's Nobel Prize, uh, which I'm sure a, a, a lot of you know. So you might be like, you know, why? Maybe this is so obvious. So I guess first is it's it's helpful to set some expectations for why this is surprising in the first place. Um, so let's just think of a bunch of random impurities. Those are the things that I have um, that in in circles and I'm colored. So these guys are random in space, there's some kind of impurity uh, and we're thinking about a non-interacting problem. So really there's, there's uh, one particle, maybe an electron, um, we, it's uh, really, we should be thinking of it as a, as a wave. Um, and so it scatters off each one of these impurities, oops, some way. Uh, and then when it scatters, if it's elastic scattering, then it's um, mod, it, it, the uh, mod K is preserved, but uh, it, it goes off at a different angle. And in, in general, there, it also has a phase shift. Okay, so um, fine. So there's a, uh, there's a wave, it's uh, mod K is preserved, but, but uh, clearly the phase of the wave function is, um, is, you know, is doing something complicated in time, depending on the exact trajectory, because both there's the phase accrued between events, these scattering events, and then there's a phase shift uh, to do with the scattering event. Um, so this is, it's qualitative, but you can kind of see that the phase of the wave function is going to be very sensitive to the specific uh, sequence of scattering events and, and the specific positions of these random impurities. And so you might guess, and this is a reasonable guess actually, uh, that um, somehow the phase uh, of the wave function uh, can be replaced by a random function of time. And again, whenever we say these things as random, we don't mean that it's really random. Obviously it's not, right? <laughs> um, and in specific examples, you could even try to compute it. It simply means for the purposes of what you can observe, some coarse grain properties, uh, it becomes indistinguishable uh, from a random function of time. Um, uh, so if, if that be the case, and so there's dephasing in that sense, 
Um, then once the phase of the wave function is not uh, a, um, an important quantity, then interference affects, or not important quantity, once it's a quantity that's not, um, that, that's more random in time, um, then interference effects drop out. And then you say, okay, you know, that's the whole deal with quantum mechanics. Uh, it's the fact that there was uh, not just the amplitude mattered, not just the intensity, but once the, once the phase information goes away, it's all about the intensity. Once it's all about the intensity, it's all about uh, just uh, probabilities. And once it's all about probabilities, the problem becomes classical. Uh, and then this is simply a classical particle bouncing around in some random background um, and it executes Brownian motion. Uh, which in particular implies uh, diffusion in any dimension. Okay, so that, that was every uh, people starting point um, that this would always be the case in a random background. It's hard to see why uh, phase information could be preserved in a way that would significantly affect the behavior of the, um, uh, the particle. And, and so people expected that there would be diffusion. In any dimension, of course, the diffusion coefficient itself could be very suppressed. It might be hard to see, uh, but that this would be the ultimate outcome. Um, so what Anderson's work showed, and this is why it was a surprise, uh, was that uh, this reasoning is incorrect. It's kind of incorrect in two different ways. So one, which is more relevant to our many body uh, thinking is when the wave number K times this mean free path uh, is much less than one, right? So what is mean free path? So there's kind of two um, uh, lens scales here. If I ignore the size of these impurities, one is uh, kind of what is known as the mean free path in this kind of classical picture, it would be uh, the uh, average distance that this particle travels between scattering events, and then there is its own its own wave number um, to or its wavelength two pi on k, uh, which gives you a feeling for um, you know how what are the on what on what land scales are su is superposition important? Maybe it's another way to say it. In 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 uh, an in, an interference effects important. Um, usually when you are thinking of, uh, which is which is where uh, our world is usually, right? When we, we, we treat light, a uh, visible light in the world as, as rays, we draw straight lines. We often forget about the fact that it has, uh, it's a wave with a wavelength. Uh, as long as we're talking about objects and behavior of light on hitting objects that are much larger than its wavelength. But once the wave, the, the size of the obstruction that light sees is comparable or smaller than wavelength, then diffraction and interference, all these things become important. So that's the same thing here. Once the, uh, once the uh, particle sees multiple impurities within its wavelength, this kind of picture may break down. And, and Anderson, in fact, shows it breaks down. Um, and, but maybe it's not so hard to see. It's as if I should really draw a picture like this. It's as if there's like impurities everywhere. So really, uh, I should be solving a problem of um, kind of particle in a box type thing. Something like if I thought of the potential that the particle sees, uh, uh, then it sees something that, you know, in any direction X that I kind of look by, it sees something where it's like at a bo bottom of a well, say, right? Um, so if, if uh, we've now, we can, we've solved a particle in a box before. Um, so if it's at the bottom of a well, we expect bound states. And in fact, they, you know, they may have some, some, um, ooh, maybe I will change it. Often it's inversely proportional to the, so there's some uh, form inside the wing. And then in particular, outside the well, there are um, exponentially decaying tails. decay yes. for the single particle wave function. This is, I don't know, mod psi of x, right? Um, and, and this is due to the classic quantum tunneling. Uh, when the particle tries to tunnel under a barrier, um, it just gets these tiny tails. So really you would, you would draw a picture like, oh, okay, so once it's kind of sandwiched between all these impurities on all sides, it is really stuck it, it's like it's stuck to the well formed by these things. 
And so it's kind of localized in here and it, it has exponentially small weight to uh, get out, right? Um, so, so this uh, introduces an important uh, quantity for um, localization, which is the, oops, sorry, uh, which is the thing that sets the uh, lens scale for this exponentially decaying tail. So a lens scale uh, associated with this is a localization length. Um, so, so, okay, so this was an intuitive um, picture for why, uh, what Anderson found makes sense, which is that when you kind of go to this limit of like uh, lots and lots of um, impurities, it may make sense that instead of having uh, uh, plane wave states that are kind of bouncing off between these impurities, instead, uh, what you actually solve is, is a problem at the bottom of a well, uh, which has um, bound states that are localized in space, right? So this word localization that we'd be talking about primarily, this lecture is uh, for localization in space. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one thing that was, that was in and Anderson's result. Um, but a second thing, which is a, a second place in which this reasoning that I have up here, the I would expect diffusion in any dimension goes wrong is in lower dimensions. Um, where um, intuitively the way to think about it is that even if the, if even in the diffusive system uh, in lower dimensions, there is a lot more probability to come back to your starting point. Um, and, and so that means that somehow the wave nature interference effects are uh, maybe more important. Okay, this is just maybe, but in terms of they are, um, which so which really gives you the dramatic result that it's uh, that um, a particle in in a, in a, in a uh, sufficiently random uh, in, uh, potential is always localized in one and two dimensions. Um, any questions? Um, what do you mean by sufficiently random? Um, so I, uh, <laughs> I didn't say. Um, what I mean is, uh, so in one dimension, um, well, actually, all I really mean is that uh, it, the, if the, the potential is uh, short range correlated. Um, so, so which means it, it excludes a few important physical cases. Uh, one is um, if, if these were the actual Coulomb uh, interactions, then that's a long range interaction, which may build in, uh, you know, because if these were charges, right? So if this was an electron sitting in the background of some kind of random positions of pluses, um, the, the actual interaction is, 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 is as a Coulomb interaction, um, which has these long tails that may correlate the landscape that the electron, the electron sees here with, with something there, right? In fact, it does. And these correlations can be very long range because of the one or R tail. Um, so that's all I mean by, so I, I want to, those kinds of, uh, the, the specific physically interesting case of Coulomb uh, can be a little bit trickier than what I'm saying here. That's all I wanted to say. So by sufficiently random, I will actually really just means uh, short range correlate. Uh, the other case that's excluded by what I say in general is um, um, quasi periodic potentials. Uh, for example, a potential that you can get by beating, you know, adding up to cosine k one x plus cosine k two x. Uh, if k one and k two are incommensurate, then these are it's like you're adding up cosines with uh, wavelengths that don't match. This gives you something that is uh, well it looks inhomogeneous, but it, it really has it's it's a, it's because it's formed from adding two cosines. It has long range correlations. Again, there this kind of reasoning can break down. Uh, and by this kind of reasoning, I mean sorry, actually I should say that this result can break down. What I have highlighted. Final comment on that is also another thing that can cause this result to change is also symmetries, which I am not, I'm not talking about. Um, so there's a periodic table for 
um, uh, to do with when you can have localized phases in it, when you can't, depending on the symmetry system. Okay, but um, so what? Okay, so 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 the so what from this page uh, is simply that Anderson's work was very deserving of a, of a Nobel Prize because it was it was not obvious that one um, has a regime where um, really if you started a, a particle at a point, it's not able to escape kind of an effective deep potential well that it sees, and so that its wave functions really become localized in space, right? And remember, these are single particle wave functions. What they give us a picture for is where the particle. Uh, really sits. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a picture of its probability uh, distribution if you measured its position. Um, so it becomes easy for us to translate uh, what the physical consequences are with that understanding. So if you say, so what? Uh, so one, so what is the title to do with the title of Anderson's original paper? Oops, that's not the spelling of absence. I doubt Anderson would have misspelled absence. Um, absence of diffusion or transport in isolation, right? So if all that was going on uh, was that you had this particle interacting with this static random background, um, uh, if this background was, um, uh, uh, so actually uh, in, in, in the sufficiently random, the second thing I wanted to say uh, in higher dimensions, what I really mean is, is this distinction. So you can, you can, um, write down and um, you can keep track of uh, the effective strength of the disorder of your background. Um, and, and people often call that a disorder strength. So that in high dimensions, you only expect localization at large disorder strengths, not always. So the thinking to do with dephasing is true when you have, um, when, you, when, when you, your background is like say sufficiently dilute as compared to the size of your uh, wave packet. It's only when you have strong disorder that you get localized. Okay. So, um, uh, but when you're when you are uh, when all the single particle states are lo are localized, then uh, all the all of them have these kind of exponentially decaying tails. They're all stuck in space. Basically, particles cannot move. If you put them in in some place, they stay put near there forever, uh, which means particles cannot move. Then charge cannot move. Energy cannot move. So the associated um, conductivities at uh, any temperature, where really we use the word temperature here to mean, it's really a proxy for energy density. Okay, so no matter what you should think of as saying is no matter how, where you kind of put these particles and how you get the system going, it won't uh, conduct, charge won't move, energy won't move. Um, and, and, and that's, that's like, that's a striking con uh, consequence of this uh, feature of localization on um, the physical transport coefficients. Second uh, is is it's also direct from the thing is that there's a comp uh, from the picture of of localized wave functions is a complete set of uh, quasi local conserved operators. So I'll draw a picture in uh, in one D of a tight binding lattice just to be specific. So say a one D lattice, nearest neighbor hoppings are negative J. Um, there is a on-site potential that's I don't know um, something. Oops, you should these. Uh, uh, so the dashed lines are 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 simply. Uh, it's a plot of V sub I versus I, V sub I is an on-site potential. Um, and and I'm, I'm gonna start using the simple disorder strength W. And by that, what I really mean um, uh, is for the simplest case where this V sub I is like an independent of, the V sub I on one side is independent of, of that on every other side. Uh, it's simply, I will take often the mean to be zero. Actually, let me not use this time average. We'll use this. And the variance. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, I think even for insulator, the conductivity as a function of temperature is not strictly speaking zero. You base Arrhenius law. Uh, it decreases exponentially in temperature, although. Um, is that true? Yes, that is true. So this is, um, and so this is stronger than. Uh, 
So what is this statement here? This is stronger than that, right? So the in isolation is important. Um, actually, why don't you hold that thought? I'm gonna say, I'll say something about that in just a few minutes um, on the comparison to the, the expectation for a band insulator uh, and what you're supposed to make of this, this statement in isolation. So just, okay. in, if I've not okay. answered it in a few minutes, ask again, okay? Um, okay. Um, Matt, yeah. Yeah, just an uh, Aran question to that. So, so if the temperature is sufficiently high, uh, uh, the the particle can take up higher energy states and then get excited and more of the well, right? So, so that could happen for sufficiently high temperatures. Um. So, so, so sorry. So I wrote this when uh, all single particles. I only said it. I should written it too. Sorry. All single particle states are localized. Um, which is the case uh, in any dimension, as long as you crank up what I'm calling this disorder strength um, as compared to other energy scales in the problem. So for example, if you have a tight binding chain, um, you have to crank up this uh, spread in the onsite potentials um, to be uh, its ratio of that to the hopping. And if you do that sufficiently in any dimension, um, all single particle states will be localized, and then this this result holds. So maybe what you're so when when you can have some uh, motion is if uh, if that's not true. If the if the if there are some uh, states that are localized at maybe lower energies, and then at higher energies they, as you were think, saying, if if the particle is able to kind of escape and explore the entire um, system, right? Then the, all all space. Uh, then, um, then this would not be true. It wouldn't be sigma of t is zero at all temperatures. Okay, okay, got it. Thanks. Okay. So strictly speaking, uh, this localization only valid if for me energy is at certain value like zero, correct? No, no. Um, again, if all single particles- I'm, I'm thinking something like mobility edge. There, so there is no mobility edge, right? That's why I said all single particle states are localized. If there is a mobility edge, then um, then the, then uh, sigma of t is not zero. It, it, it's non-zero. But if, so if you think for me energy is higher than uh, the height of those random potential, then I, I don't think random potential matters. But, I mean, but that's just a fully filled state, right? That can't conduct anything. Charge can't move in it. That's an insulating state. I think there may be a confusion between a, a band model and a continuum model where the kinetic energy is unbounded. So I think Anusha is considering a case where the kinetic energy is actually bounded by a bandwidth. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, that's, that's right. Oh, so, yeah, does that help? Um, yeah. If, if it's you. unbounded, um, indeed, that's right. If it's unbounded, there will always be a mobility edge. And then, uh, you know, this, this, this thing I had here, that all single particle states are localized can never be true. Maybe that helps. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kurt. I didn't, I wasn't processing why that. Um, so yeah, indeed, let's keep in, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep in mind a tight binding to be very specific. Um, we'll think about tight binding models with uh, uh, so they with which means that kinetic energy will always have a finite bandwidth uh, set by J, uh, and then we'll we'll be able to get into a regime in which all single particle states are localized by cranking up the spread of these V sub i's on different sites, and the spread is what is is like set by W. I'm, I'm not V sub i squared is set by W um, square root, I guess. And that's this W is what I'm calling disorder strength. So if you push that up enough, in particular, usually you have to push it up. Uh, to be uh, we uh, well above the uh, bandwidth for the kinetic energy part. So well above, um, you know, some number J where the number in front depends on the dimension. Then all single particles is localized. Okay, and that's a regime I'm, I'm gonna primarily talk about here. Um, so if, we, if I'm there, uh, so actually maybe, maybe I should do that up front. Uh, for everything I'm going to say here, I'm not going to think about mobility edges. So move this down and, oops, what's up? 
so that you know it applies to everything we're saying. Um, so, all right, so, uh, so the next thing is that there's a complete set of quasi-local uh, conserved operators. Maybe you, you can see that directly. There, there's nothing uh, remarkable about them. If all the states are localized, then here are each of their wave functions as a cartoon. They don't actually look like this. They also oscillate and stuff. Um, so, you know, uh, if, if at best you should think of these exponential type um, uh, things I'm drawing as envelopes. But, you know, and then they also need not be localized in single sites. Sometimes they can have things like it's kind of on two and then asymptotically dies away, stuff like that. Okay. Nevertheless, every single state looks like this asymptotically, it has tails, it's decaying. Um, and then I can think of the uh, n hat, uh, n alpha hat operator, which is the occupation, uh, the operator that measures the occupation number of orbital alpha. Um, right. And then, um, so of course, this is these are the orbitals for the tight binding Hamiltonian. So by design, these things would commute with the Hamiltonian. Uh, they commute with each other. Um, so I've got I've got a complete set. They're certainly conserved, and they're quasi-local because of the fact that my um, they are the orbitals uh, have a spatial um, structure, which uh, which 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 with these tails. So it's basically they are. Um, they have some support, right? Okay, um, and 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 so in particular, it means that you could label every single state of the system with however many particles you have, every single stationary state, um, as a telling me what all the different occupations are. And I don't know, they're n orbitals. So these label all the eigenstates of the system. Okay, so, so far so, so good, but this is another feature of uh, being localized. When a system is uh, all single particle states are localized, then you're able to find the associated uh, con conserved operators that have this locality structure uh, to them, uh, and you can use them to label all the eigenstates in the system. Okay, fine. Um, the third to make a, uh, to sharply connect to our first lecture is there's a breakdown of ETH. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in great detail. This is, again, it's important for how people try to find these uh, regimes numerically. Um, but maybe you can see it immediately, right? So uh, just to give you a feeling, ETH would tell you that if I looked, remember ETH applies to few body observables. In particular, it would certainly apply to uh, something like the uh, uh, occupation of uh, uh, a site I, right? So. Uh, ETH would tell you if I started with a state in which uh, the, um, oops, started with a state uh, that, that should have thermalized to infinite temperature um, with uh, uh, an average occupation of one half. Basically, ETH would tell you it's, it's whatever the corresponding, uh, it's called the, the expectation value in eigenstates should be whatever the corresponding value is in the thermal ensemble, which I picked to be a half. Um, this is expectation and I, and and then if you if you looked at the histogram of this across eigenstates, you would get something that's pretty narrow around one half. Um, and uh, so, in particular, ETH, if the system thermalized, the single particle states are delocalized. If they're delocalized. They do something like this, and the distribution narrows without. Um, however, in our localized case, uh, the particles are stuck. They don't uh, delocalize over the entire system. So they are, instead of seeing that the occupation on, uh, in eigenstates is close to a half, you will instead see that the, uh, either the state has nearly no particles near that site, so there's a peak at zero, or it has that orbital, those orbitals occupied, which have significant overlap on the site I, and so something like that. Uh, and this distribution has no flow with L. Um, no flow at large L. 
uh, oh, I'm sorry, I just started using the symbol L. By L, I mean a linear size of the system. Uh, okay, uh, I'm sure there's some experts among you, so I should really say the ETH here, I've done a little bit of leap, which I didn't talk about, uh, which is that the ET notion of the ETH can be extended even to uh, non-interacting systems, um, goes by different names, maybe people call it weak ETH. Um, and that's what I've done in comparing this, in, in, in kind of using the um, notions that I developed in the last lecture to the delocalized case here. I'm not gonna talk about it further. Um, I think a number of people have worked on it, in particular, one of the organizers, uh, Kun Yang has worked on it. Um, the only thing to say is that you should think of it as ETH applied to the single particle spectrum. As long as you think of all the, everything we said, but applied to the single particle spectrum in terms of, instead of the many body one, it's, it's really the same notion that we developed in terms of random matrices. It's when you generalize it to the many body spectrum that you'd be slightly careful, but okay. Um, but but the, 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 the uh, qualitative ideas go through as is. So in particular, every eigenstate uh, behaves as if it were the same as the thermal ensemble for this few body observable, hence this uh, narrowing around one half, as opposed to in a localized case where the particles are stuck, they don't, um, the system is not ergodic, they don't thermalize. So instead the eigenstates reflect that by showing that they either have particles there or not basically outside, so, right? So that's what these things look like. And the reason I went through this is simply because one, two, and three uh, are, features of interacting localization too. Interacting localization, many body localization, localization. Um, we'll have all these same features. So they, it shows breakdown of ETH. It will have this uh, quasi local conserved operators, complete set of them. Principle, you're supposed to be able to label all the eigenstates by them. And it has this uh, formal this formal property in isolation too, if um, there is what is known as full MBL, which is the version of uh, all single particle states are localized. Okay, now coming to the thing which maybe some of you asked me about, uh, band insulators, what's the comparison, uh, and also an important, and, and, and actual connection experiments, right? So um, in, in, in a, certainly in material experiments, um, electrons are not just isolated in some random background. Um, a number, there are another number of other things going on, but in particular, um, there are phonons, so um, vibrational modes of the lattice. Um, so, with these phonons in amorphous insulators, amorphous insulators. Um, the prediction due to Anderson localization is basically much smaller low temperature conductivity as compared to the Arrhenius prediction. Okay, um, so specifically, uh, to write it in terms of resistances, the resistance is much, uh, is, is, so there's a scale. Now, uh, the Arrhenius law would predict that it's X T naught over uh, capital T at low temperatures. So if you had a bad insulator, a Fermi energy in the middle uh, in, in the gap, then uh, as you went to lower and lower temperatures, you would see that the uh, resistance behaves um, as, as here with the Arrhenius form, T naught would be set by the uh, uh, difference between it, it would be it would be that would, it would be set by the chemical potential and kind of the the gap anybody gap, um, but the amorphous insulators it's not this instead in general it's this there is a power in there um, where the power is in general less than one not equal to one so exactly what it is now. Um, I think depends on uh, whether um, the uh, the the fact that uh, Coulomb interaction between electrons is important or not. So I'm not going to derive these. I just wanted to mention it. Um, there's there's 
uh, 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 dimension dependent uh, value by uh, worked out by Mott. Efros and Shalovsky argue that it's one half. Uh, do I have this right? I think it's just a P, not a one over P in there. Yeah, yeah, that's right, right? Because I was like, I feel like I've double, I've double <laughs> um, divided. Thank you. Yes. Because uh, I wanted to diverge much faster. And I was like, it looks like I've done the opposite. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so because the, the resistance has to blow up much more than in the clean case, which is P is one. Um, do I do that? No. Ugh. Maybe. You want it to diverge slower than Arrhenius. You, you want the resistance to be small compared to the Arrhenius law. So. Well, I think I want it. Um, oh. Never correct real time, maybe. <laughs> um, I think I have this right, don't you think? So because I, um, you know, it's that localization, if, at least the way I understand it is that localization um, gives you these uh, uh, tails, right? And you're relying on these tails to make these long hops and, and effect, then conduct. I think it's it's P, P equal to one half for ES. And I mean, in the exponents, T naught over T one half, for F of Shklovsky, uh, and T naught over T to power one over T plus one. That seems more. right to me too. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm, yeah. I'm Boris yeah. Shklovsky student, so uh, yeah, it so must I be have, true. Um, so then don't I have, oh, so you think I've taken two extra powers of P, a uh, one P, so I should just do P over here? Yeah, it, it's it's just P, and P go to one half for years. Okay, and, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna write a note to myself and correct it later. Um, but okay, sorry. So, but but the uh, I'm not deriving any of this. The point I simply wanted to make was that uh, this uh, this prediction, which um, fundamentally follows from the fact that single particle states have these low um, decaying tails. Um, so a, a consequence of spatial localization. Uh, is reflected in this behavior of the resistance as a function of temperature, which is actually widely observed. Now, the exact value of P and whether it's one half or not one over D plus one crossovers, people uh, still discuss it. And um, so that, that ex you know, so I think one half is more frequently observed than the one over D plus one, um, but that is not one, less than one is certainly observed. So this is the big, uh, a big prediction that is seen uh, uh, and a big prediction of uh, localization that's seen in raw materials. Okay, um, sorry, I have maybe not doing justice to the topic, which is supposed to be many body localization. Uh, I started at 1210, 1.30, right? Okay. Um, okay, so moving on to uh, many body localization. Um, now, since, since the original work of Anderson, um, there have been several people have uh, time and again um, tried to make progress on the many body problem. And by many body, we literally mean uh, back to the statement we had here. Um, I'm going to copy it. By, by many, uh, oops, did I not succeed? Uh, by many body, we mean we want this uh, a statement like this to hold, even with interactions. Um, and, and, and so people have time and again asked, what do the, uh, what is the role of say, if this was an electronic system, electron electron interactions play on these statements about localization, in particular, does it go away? Uh, do we once again, um, you know, do you you can kind of um, uh, guess what the problem might be? So just to give you a picture, you know, if we look save it in one D. So again, I'm just drawing these. Uh, um, this is a pot potential V of X versus X, something that's uh, spatially inhomogeneous. Um, and if I if you had a single particle hopping in this kind of uh, background, um, we said in one dimension, in particular, it would always be localized. So say particularly there are two of these states, something like this and that. Uh, they had energy E1 and E2. Um, but if you had electron-electron interactions uh, and you could find states where you kick, 
kick this one to a lower energy. So you start at E1 here, you make this E1 prime and you start E2 here and maybe you could make this E2 prime, right? Uh, which is now more delocalized looking. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't even try, but this is a picture of my wave function there. Um, but so if you if you have processes like these that can that can uh, you know borrow energy from one electron, give it to the other one, and effectively kick it to a state that has a which is more delocalized, then you might worry, and and people uh, worried for now more than fifty years uh, that you might just have delocalization with interactions. And so the question always becomes: Is there a percolating uh, network? of such energy resonances. Um, and hopefully it's clear in what context I'm using the word resonance. By resonance, I just mean that you're able to find in the non-interacting problem um, uh, pairs, it could be more, uh, numbers of states that have nearly the same energy. So that um, uh, an, an, an interaction would mix those states. So right, the question is, is there a perfectly network of such energy resonances? How do you keep track of it? And, and, and how, do you answer, how do you answer this question? Okay, so for the purposes of, of giving you some feeling for the answers that people have given, um, let me restrict our further discussions to short range interactions. So we will not worry about Coulomb. Um, talk only about fermions or spins. So there is a um, locally bounded Hilbert space. I almost, I implicitly did that even in the Anderson one, but I'm really thinking that, uh, you know, I, on this lattice model, I only can have a, a finite number of sites, uh, states locally. Uh, and then, like I said before, we're going to put everything on a lattice. Um, okay, so um, one thing that started uh, the current um, set of a lot of current interest in MBL, maybe it's not even so current anymore, <laughs> was from Bosco, Elena, and Al Schuller, BAA from 2006, who uh, tried to give a definitive answer to this, again, building on earlier work from Al Schuller and, and Anderson and, and others, um, that, that, that the answer was no. Basically, they said, is there a percolating network of such energy resonances? Their answer was no in any dimension at weak enough disorder strength, which I use the symbol W, uh, sorry, at weak enough, sorry, not W, uh, weak enough interaction strengths. Interaction strengths. Uh, they said there is a notion of MBL, okay? So that was, that was, uh, and that was, and again, I should say, since before BAA, people have gone back and forth whether the answer was yes or no. But um, their answer was 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 no. That there is no, you don't need to worry about these interactions from the perspectives of delocalizing um, the system. Uh, instead, uh, at weak enough interactions, you can have a notion of MBL. Um, so okay, uh, I want to give you a maybe quick and dirty. This is not the way they present it, certainly. Um, uh, but I think it's, 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 I'm just, I'm, I want to put it in the language of how uh, one of the main things people do in the MBL community to try to understand um, when delocalization, when, when there can be something that's localized. Um, so I'll give you a quick and dirty version of their, uh, this is not the, their key argument. Uh, this is the, this is even a quick and dirty version of their, their argument for their argument, <laughs> okay? And let me do it at strong disorder. Um, okay, so um, they say, uh, look, the single particle problem, um, there's a key length scale in it, of course, which is the localization length. Uh, I think I called C localization. This is a localization length in lattice units. So they say you should break up the system on in uh, chunks of these um, linear size given by the C localization. Um, and 
So that really all the physics of interest of to start to ask about the questions of delocalization can be asked in, in the context of what interactions do within a localization volume. So they have a single particle spectrum that they're looking at in a localization volume. Um, so now the localization volume is finite, right? So the single particle spectrum is discrete. There's a bunch of energy levels. Uh, it's got some bandwidth, uh, which is W sub S, and it's got some energy level spacing on average, delta C, um, which is W sub S over C localization to the D, right? Just um, hopefully everybody sees that, which is simply to say that if I look at something that's C lock by C lock by C lock in, in D dimensions, I would have these many sites in it. That means those are the number I expect that many number of states. Um, so that uh, the energy level spacing between them is kind of the total energy bandwidth divided by the number of these states. So those are two energy scales. Um, and then and then in this game, what you're often doing, actually, maybe I'll copy that. Um, what we're often doing is simply trying to do at first order, trying to estimate the scale of um, matrix elements of the perturbation that you put in as compared to this, the energy level spacing. Okay, so um, you so you now add uh, four body interactions, uh, uh, two body interactions, sorry, between these electrons. And you try to estimate the matrix element of these interactions. So the matrix element between a some state, let's say, what I call it, alpha, and another state, uh, beta, with two electron hole pairs on top. Um, now this is simply an s. This uh, a j interaction is the scale of the interaction, uh, and then you you pick up. Uh, a factor of one over square root C log to the D um, because you want to know the amplitude to find um, the electron at, I don't know, a particular site, another electron at a site, and then you promote them to, to two holes, okay? So those are the two factors of one over square root C log to the D. Um, then you say, uh, so, I, so I should say matrix sum in alpha and beta with two electron hole pairs in kind of specific um, sites. And then you say, how many such terms do I have? The number of such terms would scale with the number of uh, possible places you could make these electron hole pairs. So in total, you, the total matrix element, the total amplitude for a process that would create elect, uh, two electron hole pairs on top of any given state that you give um, would be J int. Um, over square root, no. Sorry, just J int, because I multiply the two. Um, and, and so then the, um, the quick and dirty argument is to say you compare this matrix element to the energy level spacing delta C. Whenever this, to this um, matrix element is uh, much less than this energy level spacing, then somehow the discreteness of the spectrum that you have locally saves you. And uh, this term is unable to uh, connect enough of these levels to kill the localization of the interacting system. Okay, so um, that's basically an MBL if the J int much less than delta C, which if I write out um, in terms of the bandwidth and the localization length, it's, it's this. Um, and immediate note is this quick and dirty argument is uh, certain, it misses a logarith logarithmic factor. Um, maybe I should pause and take some questions because I've just been talking for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, there has been some uh, there have, have been some discussions actually uh, back and forth among the participants on uh, modding insulator or modding anything insulator. Maybe you can take a look and uh, address maybe some of them as you see fit. Um, yeah, I 
Oh, uh, I see. So uh, the mod insulator uh, is, uh, so basically that's a phenomenon as, um, oh, okay, it's so actually maybe maybe in response to that question, Yi Huang, uh, perhaps this thing is worth saying. This is how you tell the difference between mod insulators and amorphous insulators where there's um, physics of localization um, I don't think this uh, this mod law has has anything to do with mod insulator. No, it I doesn't. Think... But but, but it, no, I, sorry. The physics is very different. But I thought the question was simply, um, how do you empirically know? Because you know, and nobody has a finite temperature insulator in the lab, right? Nobody actually has zero conductivity at finite temperature or uh, infinite resistance. Instead, what you measure is some some uh, resistance and you look at the behavior as a function of temperature to decide is it a metal is it an insulator right and so then the question is how do you know the physics of right. localization is going on in the background and I, the way i understand it is only by asking uh you, you it's not an arrhenius law Right, basic, yeah, there's not, it's not the physics of a zero temperature insulating state with a, um, a gap to creating charge excitations on top, whatever be the uh, reasoning, be, however you get the insulating state, whether it's due to interactions or, uh, or whatever, what, if, if, the, if, the, the, um, if what you have, however it uh, showed up was an insulating state at zero temperature with a gap to single particle excitations, and I think you expect the, Arrhenius law, if the single particle excitations are delocalized, but if the, um, if, the if, if instead the insulator is sufficiently am amorphous so that those single particle excitations are localized, then I think that's where you expect this. Yeah, so for mod insulators, P is one. I think so for, for clean mod insulators, P is one. That's, I think, what I'm I saying. guess that for, for mod insulator, maybe by measuring the Arrhenius law, you can get the, the size of the gap. Yes, I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, and yes, uh, by answering Andrew in, in, the, in the question, I think it should be P equal to one, just normal activation energy. Yeah, that's right. But I think, I hope I've answered your question too, which is the distinction, this is not a mod insulator, but I think it's more important to just say, how would you tell in the lab? And I think it is that the Arrhenius law doesn't hold, um, right? Because nobody measures zero conductivity. Right, right. Um, okay, so yeah, okay. Maybe that's all the questions is, um, did this be, uh, yeah, was um, there any question? Mind, the part? Yeah, uh, do you mind just going over again, this sort of estimation of the matrix element? I think I just lost uh where you were how the square the square roots of the of volume of these like patches came up yeah so i think basically so if you looked at the um uh, maybe i should have written it out a little bit explicitly so let's see so if i wrote an interaction term that looks like this j interaction um, i'm writing at the corner of the screen sorry um c uh uh maybe i'll write it uh, let's do spinless fermions so i will do something like i uh, destroy inside zero, or maybe, okay, sorry, I'll pull it, pull it down here. Let me just push myself there. So if I look at a particular term that tries to destroy two electrons on two sites and create them on neighboring sites, okay? Um, so something like this. So then um, in order to figure out the matrix element, I'm asking in a state alpha, uh, you know, I, each one of these destructions, right, would pick up an amplitude for the fermion to be on that site. Uh, and if the picture is that the fermions are basically uh, uh, delocalized on this localization volume, so then it would be one over square root of the volume that they're delocalized in. So that's what each of these factors is. Did that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And then you, you're able to create two uh, um, uh, fermions in sites two and three uh, if, if those are empty, so no further. Right, thanks.
Okay. Um, uh, but but actually, the um, details of this kind of square roots and stuff aside, I think what I wanted to say about this um, is is maybe two things. One is that this this kind of very simple minded compare the matrix element of some part of um, of a any kind of perturbation that you're adding. So here are the interactions to the to an the effective level spacing relevant. So here are the single particle level spacing. And, and, and when they become, when one is much smaller than the other, matrix summits being much smaller than the other, there can be localization. This argument is used extensively. I think it's almost one of the only uh, arguments I know of that people use to try to uh, understand what different processes do on top of localized systems. So that's one general point I wanna make. Um, there's some subtleties here in, in this, but I'm, I'm skipping over them. Um, uh, and the second is that um, my understanding of the uh, quick and dirty version of, of where um, Bascal and Arnold Schuller's estimates come from and their conclusions come from is, is that they're thinking about these processes built on top of the single particle spectrum locally, right? So they're using the single particle spectrum in a localization volume uh, and, and, and just hold that in, in as a thought in, as we come to um, the subsequent work that disagrees with the conclusions of Pascal and Elshur, which have a different starting point there. So that's maybe the two, two key things to take away, that there is a regime when you do this, you start with a single particle spectrum and localization volume, do these kind of estimates for what your interaction term does and find a regime um, at strong disorder or short localization lengths, um, which is basically a criterion like this, um, at which you would in general always say that uh, MBL can persist. So I wanna finish this up by drawing a phase diagram and then I wanna keep telling you where, how people keep, how keep uh, what people believe. Uh, this, the, this phase diagram that I'm gonna draw has been changing over time. So uh, let me just draw. So uh, let me orient you, the axes are, um, let's get rid of this stuff extraneous. Uh, the axes on the, on the uh, x-axis is uh, something that's the disorder strength over J. So basically the non-interacting problem lives on the x-axis. Uh, I'm working in one dimension where the uh, single particle problem would always be localized um, in the absence of interaction. And I'm furthermore working at um, temperature, which is infinite, so that, you know, because that's another third axis I should draw. What is the um, energy density I'm looking at? But I'm looking at kind of the uh, infinite temperature. Um, so, okay, so this, so this axis is non-interacting, it's fully localized. And I think what BA says that there's a regime of uh, interaction strengths at any uh, W over J in which this, this localization that's non-interacting kind of persists. And then, you know, it goes away to something that uh, obeys the aquatic hypothesis is actually thermalizing and, and, and is a metal. Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's the phase from, that's taking their arguments and applying it to one dimension for temperature. And, and this is the kinds of phase diagrams they, they predict. Um, okay, so then the next uh, change in this came from de Roque and Huvenier's. Um, I think I have the year right. It's either 2016 or 15. I think it's 16. Um, where we let me go back to this question. That's the way I framed this. So we I gave you the BA answer and their um, corresponding phase diagram. But now we'll ask this question again. Is there a percolating network of such energy resonances? So again, you take the non-interacting point, add some interactions. Uh, and you ask, uh, would you would you always delocalize? So they give an answer that says, which is actually um, yes, uh, which is always yes if dimension d greater than one. Uh, so for any interaction strength over j greater than zero and w over j, um, and whereas in one d uh, they do they do say there's MBL. Uh, no for J 
interaction over J. Okay, so um, the, the short version of both these answers is basically they say no MBL in D greater than one, no matter how weak your interactions. And, uh, and yes, MBL, this MBL is only possible in D is equal to one in certain um, parameter regimes. Okay, so that's a change from what um, the AA said, which is they really reduced the, the uh, phase space in which MBL could be stable. And uh, so that even in one dimension, in higher dimensions, I should just draw thermal everywhere. In one dimension, they change the phase diagram to look like this. Right, so again, this is interaction scale. This is uh, the disorder scale. So you see that um, the, where's the BAA line for some comparison? I mean, these are just, I'm not putting these lines to mean anything, but just qualitative feature. The BAA line was allowing for an MBL regime here as well, um, which, uh, which, which the Stirok and Hoveniers, um, the processes they're considering, they argue would destabilize MBL over here. So, uh, and, and, and then destabilizes MBL everywhere in, in, D, in two and higher dimensions. Um, so what was their argument? Where did it come from? I'm not going to give the whole thing to you. I just want to give you uh, in the, in the, it's a matrix element compared to energy level spacing type argument again. Um, but the starting point is different from BAA. So what they're saying is that, um, you know, there are rare um, regions in space. If I looked across my um, disorder potential landscape, where in, this, in such rare regions, um, the uh, effective inhomogeneity is very small. So the inhomogeneity is pretty small. This might be a region where um, with interactions, really the starting point is that it is a thermal system that you know, obeys the ETH, like we discussed in the uh, first lecture, so that I shouldn't start with a single particle spectrum here. I should really start with the many body spectrum for this region, in this rare thermal region. And then I should ask about the effects of this rare thermal region on um, blobs around me, which are the kind of BAA localization volumes. Um, okay, so they so that's that's to me that's a key starting point difference. Where where um, the quick and dirty argument for BAA started with a typical localization volume and a single particle spectrum there. These uh, Dirac and Hovenier start with rare um, volumes that you have to kind of look around in your sample and find them where the starting point of single particle uh, spectrum is, is they argue wrong. And instead that one should start with the actual many body ETH thermalizing spectrum for that region. Uh, and then they ask for the effects of this kinds of region on these volumes. And they argue that they would, by again, doing a very similar matrix element level spacing type comparison, that this would destabilize any BAA type localization volumes in two and higher dimensions. Um, but in one dimension, there's a regime where it, it wouldn't, and that's, that's where this phase diagram came from. Uh, Ma'am, yeah. uh, uh, so is it possible to solve the system exactly, like say using stochastic differential equations or something, to model the disorder? Uh, could, sorry, could you say that again? Uh, is it uh, has it been done that uh, the the full system has been solved completely by making use of say stochastic differential equations or something to model the disorder? Uh, nobody has a full no. Uh, there is no exact solution that I know of, um, in for the interacting problem. So the uh, B, uh, what uh, B uh, Bascal and Arnold should actually do is um, is give a, is a per, is a perturbative argument. Um, going, I mean, this what all I did there was like is just doing some first order comparison, and what they are they try to do is is to argue about the um, the uh, perturbation theory at higher orders and how it, it's not going to uh, change this conclusion. Um, what these guys do is uh, use the first order argument to 
say that when that first order already, um, I, there's an instability to localization, I don't care about what higher orders would do, I'd always find delocalization. That's how they argue that a D is too, you would never have any MBL. It's like you start with something that's MBL, but you have, and then you say, put in this rare thermal region, and at first order already uh, for the for connecting this to what's around it, if you if you can argue that things delocalize, then they say, okay, that's that's that, and uh, there is no MBL because that starting point is unstable to including the thermal region. But 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 in short, answer to your solution, your question is, uh, uh, no, there's no exact solution for any of this. Oh, uh, I'm also like supposedly. Uh, is it possible that the the particles are bosons and J interaction could be negative, and in that case, you could still have a many body localization of source. Uh, um. So so the so I'm not actually talking. I've been talking about um bounded Hilbert spaces and fermions. So if you made them, if you so no, I'm not actually talking about that physics. So where, you mean, you're saying where all the bosons go and sit on a site. Um, is that right? That's what you mean by making it? Yes, yes. By, by, by J interaction becoming negative that like the adjacent particles attract each other and then they get localized to a particular site. Or something. Right. Um, so that is not the physics of what I'm talking about. Um, although it, 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 would, um, it would result in localization. I mean, the physics of that is, is I think people think of that in terms of like um, real space condensation, right? It's some notion that all the, you're really trying to form a condensate um, in space, right? In a way, okay. uh, you wouldn't have a somewhat dynamic limit for that model. Basically, the particles are highly, highly non-uniform um, in the ground state for sure. And also all the low-lying states. Yeah, and, uh, and, and so there is some sense in which uh, it, it is localized, right? Uh, couldn't because it, um, uh, in, there's not a meaningful thermodynamic homogeneous limit for the right. systems too, right? Right, right, exactly. So it's, yeah. it's localized in a much stronger sense in some yes. sense. Yes, yeah. yeah, it is localized in a much stronger sense. And then there, uh, and, and I think, I mean, I know people have, people do think about this, um, but, but that's not what I'm talking about. Right. Okay, got it. And, and one final thing, so so both of these seem kind of circular because in the uh, BAA case, we started with localization and ended up at localization. But in this case, we started up with like uh, delocalization and ended with delocalization. So so that seems a bit uh, strange to me. Oh no, so so I shouldn't know. I, I, um, let me say exactly or, or a bit more specifically what they do. Here they, you know, in, in BA, they're trying to, it's a perturbative argument about a point that is fully localized. Because after all, if you're in the business of um, doing perturbation theory, it, it's only meaningful if the, you know, you, you're, you start at the right point, right? Um, you can't perturbatively start in something that's localized and uh, hope to describe something that's delocalized. They're just, they're, they're very different. Your perturbation theory would be poorly behaved. So, um, the, in fact, what they're trying to argue is that the perturbation theory in some regime is, is well behaved so that they can uh, try to connect their Anderson insulator to the many body insulator, right? So that's what they're doing. They're, so they have to start at the point that they uh, need to get to in order for a perturbative type argument to make sense, right? So that's what they're, what these guys are doing is not actually starting with delocalization quite. Um, so let me actually draw a little bit more here. What they're actually saying is uh, in, in the BA argument, there are regions they have ignored, which are these rare thermal regions where the starting point is wrong. They should instead have started with these ETH things, but these are still finite regions. And then what they argue about is what is the effect of this finite thermal, but, uh, but thermal region, or I should start with the many body spectrum on putatively localized blobs around it. And they, they put in the localization through the fact that they say that the interaction between this, this rare thermal regions and these like localized blobs, uh, other localized blobs has spatial structure. That is that it decays exponentially in space with some, some C, right? Which, which should be related to the localization one. Um, and then they argue that in, in two and higher dimensions, 
putting in a finite thermal region is enough to make the entire system thermal. So that is this finite thermal region will, will grow if you looked at this process as a function of time. Um, you put it in initially and it very slowly grows absorb and, and, and more and more of what I initially called localized blobs um, become thermal. Uh, okay, yes, got it. Right. So, so what they're in the business of studying is a destabilization process of, they're not, they're not, they're, they're in fact looking for where already at first order a perturbative argument breaks. Um, and then, and then arguing that that means it's delocalization. Okay, thank you. Got it. Um, okay, so that, that was, that's where theoretic and homeos were. And, um, you know, there's been some um, uh, primarily in one dimension numerics trying to test the pictures they have. Um, uh, uh, Phil Crowley, my former postdoc, and I have uh, studied these thermal regions as, you know, I've studied setups like these, which is a thermal ETH type system connected to an Anderson insulator to try to ask uh, how they behave if, if it's an instability. Uh, and I think what I can say, what I is that um, uh, I do, if such regions can form, I think the instability that Dirac and Humaniers, um have identified is there. Such so that is these large finite thermal regions could uh, eventually thermalize the entire system, uh, in, 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 in Anderson and Slater. Okay, but I, I want to get to. Um, Kind of uh, where people are right now, right? So, so this was this was 2006. So I've changed the face diagram a little bit, right? Now, more recently, um, several uh, groups. Um, they're kind of primarily two ones: Lev Widmar and collaborators, um, and uh, my colleague down the hall, uh, Anatoly Polkovnikov, uh, and three cells, Polkovnikov. This is kind of the last two years, I would say. 2018-ish onward, um, two, three years. So I'm not gonna go over, uh, it's, it's, I'd say they're primarily numerics, um, few arguments um, where they're really saying even the one dimensional result is wrong. So their answer is basically no MBL in NAD. Right, so it's like, uh, what is it? Pendulum swung back totally the other way. If you remember, I started this lecture with uh, why you should be surprised with uh, the result with, with, with um, the result of localization at all, with this whole kind of uh, everything should become classical and things should diffuse. And in some sense, if you believed uh, Le, uh, Vid, Le and, and Anatoly and so on, that's where we're back at in the interacting case. Uh, so they would say they think any dimension now, Wendy's it's also not special, uh, all that's going on in terms of really asking do, does the system thermalize at late times or not? Uh, the answer is just yes. Yes, it always does. Um, so, okay. So this is simply to, to tell you, you know, how this has progressed. Um, and, and this is kind of set off. I'm, I'm not going over how they are arguing this, uh, but it's certainly set off a bunch of, of work that's whether or not there is a true MBL phase somewhere here, I think uh, has has helped us identify other features of even what might be the thermal phase. Um, and this will be my last thing and, and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, and so this is things that uh, were um, I've worked on recently with um, my postdoc Phil Crowley and we're also doing your on now. I think Alan, who was at least in the audience was also worked on um, is this. So let me, let me actually, uh, uh, I've changed the axis a bit. So let's let's forget the y-axis for a minute. So I've put the um, uh, disorder strand W on J in the x-axis. And let me actually take a cut of this phase diagram. Let me just set the interaction strand J uh, int over J, the hopping, to be something order one. So I'm not varying that. Uh, just, you know, it's like taking a cut on this phase diagram. Let's look at a cut. Um, and ask uh, what's going on and uh, has there, is there, what to make of all this, like there is MBL, there is no MBL, et cetera, right? So one thing to first say is that uh, 
when people when you do uh, let me actually take off this y axis for a minute because i want to say a couple of things about the x axis when you do um numerics what do you see you will often see that they're at small w over j there is something that is uh what you might call thermal you might go and numerically test the dh it might look like it obeys it pretty well um and then you would see some region which you're not sure what's going on uh and then you might see something that you would have you would call people and people called mbl uh because it it, it did not obey eth uh, it looked like the um, you know particles were stuck. Eigenstates would show in homogeneous profiles for particles, and, and, and other measures like random matrix uh, level spacing measures of breakdown, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So people would call used to would have called this MBL, and you know there's been several several maybe hundreds of works, uh, including ex, ex, cold atom experiments trying to map out this phase diagram from small size or short time studies. Um, but what's uh, uh, what at least certainly, I mean, I credit these guys with, uh, has got people thinking, uh, is, you know, uh, is this right? Is, is, uh, are the kind of phase diagrams we've been drawing from just doing numerics, is that correct? The answer seems to be no, because what, uh, if you really look at what the, um, so what I'm now going to pl plot is the logarithm on the y-axis of, uh, oops, sorry logarithm of the uh, time it takes to thermalize in units of say the hopping J. Okay, so in on the thermal regime, it's something to order, uh, you know, it's, it's, let me say approximately, it's, it's not zero, but somewhere close to zero and, and very, a slow variation. And then in near the regime where people numerically and experimentally may have thought that they were actually going into MBL, you're instead going into a regime where it's still thermalizing but just very very slowly right so on a on a log scale uh, i'm plotting thermalization time versus the disorder strength which really means here that it's exponentially uh slow to thermalize so this is sim w over j um so this is still thermal numerically people would have said i would say numerical the mbl Um, but instead, this is uh, where people thought the system was localized is instead, if you're more careful and thinking, looking more carefully at how um, quantities flow, this is instead a slowly thermalizing regime. So really, new, this, I should, this is a long lived, either I should call it slowly thermalizing or I should say it's a long lived localized regime. Um, and then, you know, it seems it's maybe still a little bit open exactly what the status is, whether, and so I'll put a small question mark, whether is this thermalization going to truly diverge at some point? And is there going to really be MBL in the sense of something that's infinitely uh, long lived localized regime? Infinitely long. -lived. So that's maybe at some sense um, still open. And certainly what's what has become apparent is that anything that people have been accessing numerically or experimentally has not been this, but instead has maybe just been this stuff here. Um, so it's kind of changed what people are focusing on, both studying this, better characterizing what this a long-lived localized regime might be. Um, things I've been thinking about in this context are, is the role of many body resonances uh, which seems to be a good way of understanding uh, what's going on in these systems at small sizes and short times. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to get to a point to show you where the, where at least some things that I'm working on are at. Uh, but yeah, I'd say the question is far from settled. <laughs> um, I, I drew three different face diagrams, right? Clearly, and they were all disagreeing with one another. Um, so there remains that there's that's one set of things still to do like what is the true phase diagram which is you know asking this question is there a true transition um how might you see it seems very likely it's impossible for us to see with current techniques um but then the the thing that i think is more interesting maybe is 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 understanding what we do see a bit better and so with that 
I'm sorry to have gone over and happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Anusha. So actually, uh, Anton raised a hand. I suppose you have a question. Why don't you unmute yourself and ask the question? And yeah. then we can get the discussion going. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Thank you for the lecture. Um, I'd like to ask actually two questions, if you don't mind. The, the first one being, so is there an understanding of the point where the why the conclusions by Basco uh, and co-authors and the more recent study of 2016, I guess, do contradict with each other? I guess probably there is some difference in the premises or is there a consideration on understanding why one of those approaches is wrong and the other one is correct? Probably this would be my first question. Mm -hmm. And yeah, probably let's start with this. And okay. The um, is... So so I think it's it's this starting point. So um, and I and I I mean, uh, I, I mean at least a few years ago. Uh, the, these groups of people were really disagreeing with each other, right? So I, I, I think if uh, any one of Pascal and Ralph Schuller were in the room, they would hotly disagree with uh, what Dero and Hovenier say. So just with that preamble, um, my um, the start the Dero and Hoveniers say that what uh, the BAA treatment is missing is the fact that they're they're, they're dealing with typical regions and and trying to understand uh, how, when you perturb with interactions, what is the behavior of the self-energy uh, for in typical regions, but that it ignores the fact that in certain rare regions, the starting point itself is incorrect. And instead, one should be starting instead of with the single particle spectrum, uh, with, but instead of that, we should be starting with the true many body spectrum or which is delocalized. And, and obeys the ETH. And then they say, if you do that, then there is an instability that we are able to identify in regimes where BAA say that uh, their perturb perturbation theory is stable. Okay, this, uh, is, this is, makes okay. sense. But to this, I have a, um, like, at least naively, like what, what could break down in this multi, uh, many body consideration is that like this premise that a rare thermal region leads to localization bases itself on the fact that it like coherently influences the infinite region around it. And what I would imagine is that like this should stop at some point. So if you start with a rare thermal region, which has a finite size, uh, then I would imagine that it, yeah, it slowly, uh, it slowly grows by means of this some sort of, if, if you want the thermalization of its neighborhood, but this is, bound to stop somewhere because this time can diverge. So uh, this, this thermalization time, I mean, in this very procedure, and uh, I, 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 I just I just fail to see where this, uh, this uh, process uh, would stop. And uh, I mean, let me, let me rephrase this like this. So uh, if this was like true without any any remarks. The, the, the idea that any thermal region leads to thermalization in like arbitrary large neighborhood, then I would imagine that naively planting an infinitesimally small region, thermalized region in any lock any originally localized system, even let's say a spin glass, would immediately uh, lead to delocalization, which probably sounds quite unconvincing that's okay. why it feels um, like this this should stop somewhere right so let me actually let me speak to that so um the uh so so i will make the uh, let me make the formal statement correctly so in let me do two in higher dimensions right where this is this is uh there's the claim yeah, is yeah. there is no stability for localization so what what is the process they say is run away uh so the process is exactly as you said this rare thermal region so let me first say, uh, where they deviate from BAA, I said was, oh, they say this thermal region should be treated in ETH. So, but one immediate consequence of that, I should say, you notice this delta C here, right? Instead of this delta C, the energy level spacing being polynomially small in the localization volume, it starts to be exponentially small in the localization volume, okay? So that immediately you see that the relevant energy level spacing you're starting with is much tinier in the Diroc and Hoveniers case as compared to the um, BAA case, 
So it's not the single particle spectrum, it's the many body levels. And they say, really, you should be dealing with the many body energy levels, basically. Okay, so that's, that's much tinier uh, for a given uh, C log. Okay, but that aside, it's still finite. You say, okay, big deal. Right, thermal region, maybe it absorbs a few of these guys around it. And then it somehow should, shouldn't it stop. Um, and so, okay, this is where uh, this naive first order type thinking tells you it, it doesn't in the sense that um, once this thing uh, thermalizes things near it, uh, then you, 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 you redo the argument with a slightly larger thermal region and you find that it, it, it adds. Yeah, yeah, I totally get that. Right, that, and, yeah. and, and so then, then you say, why does it not stop? The reason it does not stop is, is the fact that the many body density of states is exponentially small in the volume of the region, right? Which scales, say, in two dimension as uh, like little l squared. L is like the linear size. Whereas the um, relevant uh, matrix uh, scale controlling matrix elements only scales down exponentially with L, right? So you're going to try to compete something which is going down as e to the minus. Yeah, yeah, this, this I totally get. But um, OK, let me, let me suggest at least this. this notion so the this region yeah as just as you described it keeps growing by means of this procedure and at some point i would assume it reaches such a size that i would i would call it like microscopically large and imagining that it is in itself completely delocalized and thermalized would probably break some locality but even beyond that uh again i still fail to see how this, uh, why, why actually this, this behavior is not observed in, in a simple experiment. So imagine system, which is like single particle, completely localized. Like we know that this localization does exist in, in when you have no interaction. And then I plant a single, a single thermal region inside, inside it and uh, make the system interact with this region. And it feels like, all, all, all of a sudden, it should be delocalized like completely. So let me say two things. So one is this is exactly what we studied in 1D. That's what I drew it out here. We studied it both numerically and 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 uh, gen and these using these arguments. So, but actually, let me say something that maybe helps. Uh, so that is the statement. But the the, the thing is not immediate. Look at uh, so if you you can estimate the times it takes, right? So uh, yes, the stationary state. If you waited really forever would be delocalized. But this is such a slow process because it's relying on uh, matrix elements that are exponentially, that are decaying exponentially away uh, with distance. So if you worked out the, like, you know, do, did a Fermi golden rule rate type, type um, uh, estimation for how long it would take for something here, like you prepare a particle here and it's supposed to delocalize and you say, how long might that take? That time is blowing up exponentially with its distance from this region, right? So you, I mean, they even tried to do experiments where they try to plant this in their like um, 2D uh, atomic area because they can, they can design, des design the disorder uh, landscape as they wish. And, but, but some, but time scale that's growing exponentially with the distance is just so slow. You may see like nothing. Maybe you see it, make it to its neighbors and then, you know, your experiment is done. You've lost your atoms. Um, so does that make sense? It's so it's so slow. Yeah, it probably that... translates. Oh yeah, sorry. Probably translates to simply stating that, like, there are like a plenty of mechanisms to uh, to like, kind of cut off this behavior at some finite order, so that beyond that, this simply doesn't happen for whatever reason. I let's say decoherence or whatever, face uh, face face uh, time. How to call it? Uh, yeah. So space decoherence time, multi-particle, mini particle I don't know. Okay, um, like I kind of got the point. So the, the, the second question is concerning the, the last diagram you've, you've drawn, the, 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 yeah, the, 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 yeah, this one. Uh, shouldn't we think that there are actually systems for which we at least certainly know that there is not an MBL, but at least a thermalization hypothesis breakdown and those are spin glasses, and they're actually models which describe the fact that there is no thermalization in, in those models, like for sure. And in this case, we could imagine that like we can design a system 
which uh, is kind of kind of like a spin glass at sufficiently strong disorder and thus at least is not thermalized and this and we can hope that this critical line does indeed exist so, so is there a way to think about it like that yeah uh, so um people have tried so i should say a few things about spin glasses so I, i'm uh, far from expert on it so but i think to, tend to think of spin glasses as as they're a lot more robust than these mbl things we're talking about because spin glasses, right? People do incoherent dynamics of spins in some complicated landscape. And at least they have mean field models in which those genuinely don't relax in, in, the, in the thermodynamic limit. Um, that's not true for these MBL things we're trying to do. The MBL things that we're trying to do are, um, are relying on the fact uh, in other words, if you took if you took something that is claimed to be MBL, and you um, you added a bit of uh, as you were just saying decoherence, right? So you basically um, can allowed for instead of these uh, tight binding model with hops that somehow have uh, preserved phase information, if you somehow had some dephasing in time or something, um, both the Anderson localized system as well as the many body localized system always thermalizes in finite time, right? So this is really a statement about um, uh, isolated uh, quantum systems and the ability of a quantum system as a consequence of uh, locally having discretized energy levels um, as, as somehow not forming a bath with a continuum of energy levels. Now, if you do dephasing or something, you destroy the fact that, the, you know, the, you get rid of the fact that the, uh, on the longest time scales, you get rid of the fact that the energy spectrum is truly discrete, even locally. And then this notion of MBL is lost. So it's a lot more fragile than spin glasses. That helps. Um, I mean, so, so, which, this... is, which is to say there are, there are things that are spin glasses that are not MBL. Spin glasses are much more. Okay, but I mean, so like Hold when on. we say that something is MBL, we like at least as being physicists, we typically imply that there is uh, this uh, time scale at which we observe, observe MBL. And of course, if you wait long enough, you will probe all the, the coherent times, like the connection to the external world and et cetera, and et cetera. No, no, and, uh, no let me still, no, I, I, even as an in principle statement, I, I'm not talking about imperfections in the real world. Um, I mean that, uh, MBL is, and, and, and really L, even Anderson localization, right? It, it, it's relying on the fact, like what is quantum about it? I, and, and, and what's quantum about it, and this is, and I think it differs from spin glasses in, in this sense, um, is that you are relying on the fact, maybe I'll draw one picture. So the way to, one way I think about it is that if you have some chain, right? And then I'm really gonna draw two level systems locally and they have different splittings. Uh, one can either think of this as a spin system with some fields that are random. And so any down, up, et cetera, up, down, whatever, on different sites, right? So you start here and you then turn on some weak connections between these spins. Um, and what is MBL? If MBL existed in the thermodynamic limit, it's the statement that for this one spin over here, even though it's connected in principle to an infinite number of spins, the discreteness of the energy spectrum in combination with the fact that its connections to further away spins are like small, uh, lets it see the bath. It does never sees a bath. It sees a discrete set of lines for its dynamics as opposed to a continuum of states, which is what it would see in a thermal system. Okay, so uh, this is a very specific statement that the isolated interacting set of spins are unable to form a bath for each other. And it relies very much that their starting point had discrete levels for them. Spin, um, but if you made the dynamics incoherent in the system, um, what I call MBL will always go away because incoherent, um, the incoherent dynamics will, I, if I have like some kind of reservoir around so I can borrow, whatever little energy I need, which is a mismatch between this and that, then I'll always eventually be able to hop these things around and, um, you know, spin the diffuse so on. I don't, I don't know if that, if that helps. And spin glass is much more robust. If you, 
even if you allow for incoherent hopping, there's the um, free, and it's a feature of the free energy landscape that you're not able to relax. Here, the free energy is not doing anything special. This is just a feature of not being able to, um, yeah, for, see a continuous path in, of your surrounding space. Yeah, yeah maybe that, that's the statement. The free energy landscape does not do anything special in MBL where MBL exists. So often when you um, make the, if you go away from this isolated limit in any way, um, it, it goes away. But a spin glass by dint of being tied to the free energy landscape is much more robust. Okay, thanks. Okay, any more questions? There have been some, Back and forth in the chest, but my understanding is that the issues raised all got resolved by the participants themselves. Uh, but I'm not sure if you want to take a quick look and see if there are things that you would, would like to add. Uh, you are definitely more than welcome to do that. Uh, yeah, no, I think I, it looks like people. Yeah. Well, can I, can I ask I have a, a very quick have a question? Is it true that everything that you talked about, uh, I guess, in the last several slides are still about infinite temperature? Um, yes, yeah. Would finite temperature make any difference or add anything to the, to the, to the phase diagram? Um, finite temperatures uh, will certainly change. Um, so, so, okay, let me, I guess, so finite temperature certainly moves where this boundary is, even in this, uh, with this rare thermal region thing, right? So finite temperature will, um, will always make, sorry, the other way around. It will always increase the stability region for MBL. Right. Um, then uh, I, uh, I think what the no MBL and NED, this statement is not tied to infinite temperature. Pretty sure they would, I think they, they're trying to, the very, very general um, um, objections are, are valid at any temperature. So, so, so both of these, uh, th those are all at, uh, at any temperature. Now, um, things we've been actually studying, like trying to map this out, seeing it a little bit better and so on. We've been doing it at infinite temperature, same reason that most people do it, just that for the sizes that you have, you get more bang for your buck working at um, the temperatures. But yeah, there's, um, there's no, nothing I know of that changes uh, any of these statements of finite temperatures. Okay. Uh, I also noticed, uh, unless I missed it, uh, you didn't seem to mention entanglement at all. Um, <laughs> so, well, okay, there's a reason I bring it up, which is you emphasize the difference between MBL and the uh, spin glass, which is a, a Pascal system. Now, one difference between a quantum system and the classical system is there is no notion of entanglement in classical system, but entanglement is extremely important in a quantum system. So can I understand the, uh, well, I guess the fragility of, uh, uh, of the MBL phase as partly due to the fact that, well, I mean, even though the, 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 the free energy landscape is not so special, but your subsystem can entangle with uh, its neighbors, while well, that's not a net option in the in the in a spin glass. Um, and so actually, I would I would say the uh, so the reason I didn't mention you, you're right I didn't mention entanglement. So because the reason is I feel like often the word entanglement is very misleading in the way we use it. Right? Yes, it's um, by which I mean the following: um, in order for quantum states to be special, violate Bell's inequalities, and all these things, the entanglement between spins has to be pretty. Um, uh, monogamous, that's the word people will say, right? That is to say, really, you're talking Bell state pair type things. Um, whereas if, if, so if I just trace out a subs, like a bunch of things, and I have a rho sub A, and I measure the one Neumann entropy, to call it entanglement entropy, in my mind, is super misleading, because it is not, the state, I'm sure, does not violate the Bell's inequality. Most states don't, because that entanglement is with smeared out over so many spins, that it won't violate any bell. Like it's industry. There are classical states that would reproduce all the statistics of it. Okay. So that's one general state reason why I actually think uh, I think it's very misleading to say quantum states and and to call the one Neumann entropy the entanglement entropy, um, right? Because it it's it's not Bell's inequality violating any 
could be mostly unless it's by product. Okay. Then, um, so then the second uh, uh, context question, coming back to what you're saying, is um, it's true that there's no notion of uh, an entanglement uh, entropy as an um, as an entanglement, I guess, like a la belt, violating Bell's inequality in the classical one. But even in the MBL one, um, the I didn't talk about it, but there's this like slow growth of entanglement entropy and such. Um, which again, I, I, sh I don't know if people have said it in this language, but I would actually think this defacing and so on probably means this, that this entropy is also not useful in some Bell's, it probably doesn't violate Bell's inequality too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. To me, this, the, and the, the, the notion that quantum systems can show entanglement uh, has never been a reason I've ever been able to understand any of these dynamical phases. Mm. Maybe I should say it that way. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, maybe going back to your 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 your, the, your first lecture, uh, one diagnostic between uh, 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 ETH or its violation. Some people use the volume law versus area law. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that I mean, so in terms, of, I think the entropy is certainly very useful numerically for what people do, um, but but I don't. Uh, what is the thing to say? I think the the notion of the thermodynamic entropy in the spin glass uh, is useful as well. It also right. it, it it people use it to know how many well like wells and like it's not the thermal ones. And I think the entanglement entropy is as playing the same role for these quantum systems. It's telling you the ent what the area law really means that the entropy density of your stationary states are zero, right? And that's there's zero temperature states. Like that's my understanding of it, unless that it's a, an entanglement. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So there have been some new uh, 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 discussions in the chat, which again seem to be all resolved. Uh, are there any other questions? We are, I guess, half an hour also behind the schedule, but at least I should at least give people one last chance to ask. Additional questions? Uh, I have probably one question. Okay, well, you have, you, you have the last one, I guess. Go ahead, yes. Uh, kind of remember in one experimental paper where they use um, circuit QED or cavity QED um, and design uh, an experiment to, to, to observe MBL and they use level statistics to to tell whether it's localized or not. Uh, are you saying that if there's no MBL in any dimension, um, so if they measure they, they measure the same system in longer time, they, they won't see it localized. Is that true? I mean, yeah, that, that would be the statement, yeah. I mean, so short, the statement is that, uh, you know, because if you if you people you you can and people have tried in two dimensions and stuff, you could, uh, uh, it's numerically very easy to look at level spacings uh, and, and get them. Um, and they look like they obey things that are supposed to be for MBL. But the, the thing is that the claim is that somehow that's not, um, uh, that's a feature of small size, which you can somehow translate to, to uh, short times in larger system. Whereas if you look at longer times, the claim, the thing is that, oh, those uh, statistics would change. Uh, larger L, yeah. sorry. So, so yeah. This statement looks similar to the localization in 2D. Like in real experiments, they always say something like uh, there could be delocalized states in 2D if system size is not too small. Uh, if, if, if the system size is not too big, because the localization lens will be larger than system size, then uh, the system is essentially delocalized. Um, is, is there any similarity between these I mean, two statements? So, so there, like yeah. Uh, um, uh, I guess it's a little bit opposite here. So there, you usually say, uh, if you wait, if you went to larger L, you would see it's localized, right? And the idea there right. is that the localization lens is so large, so you your system size is sitting inside it, and you you're like, no, no, these are delocalized. But if you went to larger and larger L, you would eventually find it's localized. Here it's the opposite. Here it says 
you are sitting at such a small L that you have not allowed for the processes that could delocalize the system. You go right. to larger L, you will find these things and everything will delocalize. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, with that, let's uh, thank Anusha for a set of wonderful lectures and uh, really set a good tone uh, for the rest of the week. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, we will continue, of course, um, next uh, tomorrow uh, at uh, uh, 10 a.m. again. And uh, uh, of course, it's just a reminder, we will also have uh, two uh, poster sessions uh, in the afternoons of Tuesdays and Thursdays, and some of you uh, have registered for that. And we look forward uh, to those uh, presentations as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. And